This week on the Tech on Tap podcast, we chat with Jeff Steiner about Oracle databases and containers and database as a service. Welcome to the Tech on Tap podcast with Justin Parisi, Glenn Sizemore, and Sully the Monster. I love NetApp. Oh, yeah. Hello and welcome to the Tech on Tap podcast. My name is Justin Parisi. In the studio with me today, and he's going to get first billing because he's here, Andrew Sullivan. It's also because I have the best beard. You do have the best beard of this office because I am currently in summer shedding mode. Are you a bird? Are you molting? I'm molting. Uh, yeah, I don't I do not do beards in the summer because that is way too hot and itchy. You're such a delicate flower. I am. I am a special snowflake. Um, speaking of special snowflakes, on the phone we have Glenn Sizemore. Hi, Glenn. How you doing, guys? I- I'll tell you what. I'll go head to head if you want to beard off there, Sully. Uh, I've got I've got some real good Jew curls going. This thing's getting kind of long. You know, I'm a little intimidated. You've had a beard much longer than I have, so I, you know, I'm, I have a theory that uh, because you and Glenn are such opposites, that your beards would just attract like Velcro. We're not going to test that. I just like to chime in here and point out that we've got better beer. Oh, beer! Wait a minute. Who is that? Is that Jeff Steiner? Yep. The I'm man calling in from Germany here. That's right. He's calling Sorry, in from Germany. Beard. You were saying beard. Oh, I thought yeah, you yeah. said beer. Yeah, we, no, we, we can talk about that, too. So, I mean, you do have the last name that fits. You're, you're Stein. I mean, you're, you're a cup of beer yourself. There's an entire True. law uh, about then, beer. Uh, I get addressed as Herr Steiner a lot, but the, the, name, the first name Jeffrey completely throws them off. Yeah, they have no idea what to do with that. Do they even have yeah, a German equivalent? Name's flowers too. That oh, makes it even worse. Interesting. Do they do they even have a German equivalent to Jeffrey? No. Even even just the J sound in the name is kind of hard to know what to do with. Hmm. What about Joffrey, King Joffrey of of Steiner? Never mind. I'm done. <laughs> uh, I think they recognize it as sort of a Welsh Irish kind of name. All right, enough about entomology of names. Uh, let's let's talk about okay. um, something that uh, Jeffrey or Joffrey or Steiner or whoever you want to call him or has been working on. Uh, he's been doing some work with containers, and we haven't covered containers in a while. Uh, if you are not familiar with containers, let's go over what those are. Uh, who wants to cover that, Andrew or Jeff? I mean, I, I, let's have a, a container off here. I would actually like to hear what Andrew has to say about that because I I've got a different I think I've got a different view on it. Okay, Andrew. Um, Containers, Tupperware or not? Uh, I'm a glass person myself. Okay, that settles that. But you know, containers when we when we refer to them in terms of uh, microservices and storage related things, what are those? Yeah, so I'll kind of start with a basic introduction to containers, right? So most of the time when we talk about containers, we're talking about process isolation. And really that's what's at the core of any of the modern container technologies. So think Docker, think LXC, LXD, right? All of these different things are effectively very, very similar, just implemented in slightly different ways. So the core of that is namespaces, introduced into the Linux kernel about a decade ago, give or take a year or so. So what a container is, is a, con- is a process that has been isolated from the rest of the system, leveraging namespaces for that isolation and C groups in order to, prov- to provide resource constraints on top of that. So most of the time we like to, or, or we sort of naively associate containers with virtualization, right? And it's kind of understandable that we do this, right? You say Docker run Ubuntu, doesn't matter what operating system you're in, suddenly it looks like, tastes like, smells like, feels like you're inside of Ubuntu. But the reality is what's actually happened there is the host system, the Docker daemon, has created bash, right, taken the bash process, has isolated it from the rest of the system using namespaces, and then has taken a set of files and folders that looks like the Ubuntu file system and attached it to the root names, file namespace of that particular process. But it's not an actual virtual environment. There is no, it it is a shared kernel. There is no uh, cron. There is no system D, right? There is none of these other features that we would expect inside of a full virtualized operating system. So containers are ultimately just an isolation technology. Now, all of that being said, what we actually use containers for most frequently is really an application deployment mechanism, right? Think about how applications have been deployed for the last, well, forever, 
right? Particularly when we're thinking of something like Red Hat or Debian, we think of RPMs or .deb packages or anything like that. So when I need to deploy my application, I go and say, okay, install this RPM, right? Yum local install or RPM-UVH or whatever that happens to be. And it looks at the metadata for that RPM, pulls in any other dependencies that it has. Somebody has to go in and configure these files and start these services and do all of these other things inside of there. With a container, all of that is, well, contained. It's all shipped, it's all moved around, it's all uh, uh, put together right, with my process. So if my application is something that's, for example, Python-based, I have my Python code, I have a Python executable, I have all of the modules that I would need, I have all of the supporting things that I need for that application inside of that container. So I don't have to worry about installing any packages. I don't have to do any of that. I simply say docker run my application, and it instantiates the process, and everything goes from there. So you keep mentioning this Docker thing, and that's not the only container uh, software out there, is it? Not at all. Um, usually I'll refer to Docker as being the Kleenex of containers, right? So we all know that Kleenex is a brand name for what is actually a facial tissue. Docker is a brand name for what is a container. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's other technologies, LXC, LXD. Uh, there's Rocket. There's a number of other different uh, container runtimes, including one that is managed by Docker in the open source space, Run C. Right, so there's a bunch of different ways of doing that. Docker just happens to be the most widely recognized, widely known name, as well as they add in a bunch of other uh, features on top of a base level container. Right, They manage things like networking. They manage things like, well, those container images for making it super easy to make our application portable, et cetera. Windows also has containers, don't they? They do. Yeah, you know, it, it, I'm gonna I'm gonna step. I know that Andrew is trying to keep this high level so that we don't we don't spend like forty thousand years in the weeds because we really could. This is such a big topic. But one one slight. I'm gonna challenge something you said, Sully, um, just because I think it matters for the listeners. Docker does not have a container, right? It's it's a it's a container management system or framework, software ecosystem, whatever you want to call it. But the thing that it's exercising or as you explained at the top, it's just built-in features in the operating system. And, and this is where Microsoft comes in with Windows containers. They're not C groups. It's not namespacing. The way that it works is different. We've got a virtual registry and some other stuff in there. Um, but, but, but Docker can still manage it the same way because it's, it's a common management overlay over those ecosystems. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Microsoft did a fantastic job of you know, more or less, they looked at it and said, well, Docker is the de facto standard, right? Everybody knows, everybody loves, everybody understands Docker run. Uh, so we're going to implement the Docker API, the Docker endpoint in Windows, but we're going to use our own technology in order, in order to, well, implement that functionality, right? That technology. So I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the Windows kernel. I don't know if they use something like or something named namespaces. I assume it's something similar functionality-wise. But yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you could say the same thing about how VMware with uh, vSphere Integrated Containers works. right? VMware implemented the Docker API in front of uh, vSphere. When somebody says Docker run a container, right? it's doing a live clone, right? a uh, instant clone of a virtual machine that's running Photon. And then they push the container image down into that and manage it from there. So it's not, while Docker is um, multiple things, right? Run C being a container engine, uh, Docker is a management engine as well as an API. And that, that API in particular is one that others have adopted from a uh, usability standpoint. Yeah, I think the Kleenex analogy, though, is very, very on, on point on the nose because there's just a lot of people these days that those are synonyms. Something tells me Andrew's done this talk before. Yeah. Just, just once or twice. <laughs> well, you want to hear, hear a different take on it? So, yeah, let's hear it, Jeff. Um, so here's, here's where I'm coming at this. Um, the way I got into Docker was sort of as an accident, and I'm sort of doing Docker but I don't particularly care whether I'm using Docker. I could use something else entirely. So here's the deal. Um, NetApp has had this, this, these technologies that we call things like Snapshots and Snap Restore and Flex Clone for a really long time. And obviously, we've made a lot of use out of, it, out of it. We have products like Snap Center that can do things like clone a database and back them up and restore them. But one thing that's always been difficult to do is database as a service because we've got the core technology, but for the longest time, we've been trying to figure out a good way to, um, to orchestrate it. That's the layer we've always lacked. And there's never been a clear winner. 
we're not really going to hire 300 people and then go and develop solutions for every single orchestration layer out there. And for a little while there, I was really hopeful that OpenStack might be it because we're not talking about microservices like you usually see in Docker. We're talking about big, complicated environments. So launching an entire VM just to run one database is totally reasonable. But I know what OpenStack just hasn't really gone anywhere, from, at least from my point of view. And more importantly, it hasn't gone anywhere from those database as a service customer's point of view. So what I want was an orchestration layer. And I just decided about, oh, two, three months ago to start kicking the tires on Docker. And I understood what it was. I just never actually used it before. Um, I was also well aware that we had our own um, Docker driver um, for ONTAP, among other things, and thought I'd see what that thing can do. So remember, the goal here is not to do Docker. All I want to do is database as a service. I want to be able to spin up database containers in an isolated multi-tenant environment and clone them and back them up and restore them. And I'm really impressed. So I've got this demo that I will re be releasing a video on and as soon as I can uh, do some screen grabs on some of the, the, uh, the console transcripts so you can see what it's doing. But it's... It is way cool. So the way I've been explaining Docker in this PowerPoint presentation, and here, if somebody stop me if I'm completely murdering the terminology or the technology, I have to explain what this is doing to a much less technical audience. Um, this is a challenge we've seen in the database space where the good old days 10 years ago, you win over the DBA and you've won the deal. That's all that really mattered. And now you can't go into a CIO type and start explaining the elegance of how a flex clone works, because that's not interesting. You have to say, well, I can show you a way where you can have 10 different clones of this 10 terabyte database and you can refresh them on demand. Now you don't have to hire so many expensive DBAs to sit in around and restore database copies from backup. That they can relate to. So I do have to explain a little bit about Docker. And the way I've been explaining it is actually introduced the, the concept of the namespace. Where I said, this is not emulation. This is not some special software that is playing referee in between your 10 different databases. This is built into the Linux kernel. And it's been there for a long time. And Docker isn't the technology. It's more of orchestrating the technology. And personally, I would be surprised if Oracle didn't start incorporating this directly into the products. There's no reason why they couldn't do their own database as a service and have the actual Oracle database process fork child databases off into their own namespaces and give the whole environment a little bit more security and a little better isolation. So I have to be careful on the way I'm presenting is not to scare off the, the CIO types. It's the value it provides. So I've explained how this is Docker's built, just using something built into the kernel where I can give you 30 databases running on the same server with where you can provision a new database with just one single command. You can clone a database with a single command. You can restore them with just shutting down a container and running one simple little command. And one little thing that I did that is kind of a Docker no-no is um, I did add SSHD into the container, but I mean, you can yell at me for that later. Um, so that, that's what it's actually, that's the value of it. And of course, we have to add business value onto this. You can do all of this. You can have your multi-tenant database environment without having to pay for VMware licenses. And you might want to actually run this under VMware. I'm doing that in the lab. Nothing's stopping you from doing this, but it's a way to save some more money, and the C-levels always enjoy that kind of a feature, too. Are you suggesting there's some sort of rift between VMware and Oracle licensing where we might have to pay more money that might be happening out there? Uh, that is actually, <laughs> that's another presentation that I, I just did. Um, I just did the final touches on this morning. Um, I'll be reducing that to a recording probably tomorrow morning. But yeah, um, VM, yeah, VMware, for those of you that... Um, have never heard the word Oracle before. That that company called Oracle and the company called VMware uh, disagree on a lot of things about how the technology works and how much money you ought to be paying. On the whole, Oracle would not would rather you not pay anyone any money at all because that's money that can't be used to buy Oracle products. They're just dirty capitalists. 
Ah, uh, that's 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 a pretty standard take in this business. <laughs> but but this one really isn't so much of a of avoiding the hassle with Oracle and VMware licensing because if you're going to be doing database as a service, let's say you're doing it on VMware, you're probably going to have like some four six node cluster that is fully licensed for Oracle Oracle across the board. So there's no arguments about what's running where. This is a 100% licensed cluster. The licensing problems with Oracle only happen when you've got like a six node cluster and only one of them is running a couple of Oracle database instances. So would you say there's some advantage to taking Oracle and be making it more of a, a containerized application as opposed to adding on multiple OSs via VMs and adding a little bit of extra bloat to the, uh, the process? I mean, is there, is there an advantage there to remove that extra layer? Um, well, in, yes and no. It's not so much removing the layer. It's making the whole experience better. Like, so the Oracle, the Oracle Docker file, I don't know when Oracle pivoted on this one. Um, it was not probably only when unsupported, they, uh, but pretty much impossible. Probably to, with their cloud. an Oracle database. Probably Sorry? their cloud. It would, would it be their cloud story when they pivoted? I mean, like they, they've kind of started really enhancing their messaging around cloud. Would you, would you say the container stuff tied into that? Um, I've heard a rumor that what they, the Docker files that they released are actually reflective of their own use of Docker in Oracle Cloud. I have no idea if that's true, um, but it seems reasonable. And it was kind of strange where they had no support for up until, I think, about six months ago. And then all of a sudden, they released a raft of Docker files for all of their products where you just drop the installer in a directory and make the image. And, and it works fantastic. They did a great job with it. So what I, that's what I started with. I've modified their fully GPL'd um, little configuration files for the Docker files and then built an image that works a little bit different. Now, in contrast to a lot of use of Docker where it's Microsoft services, this, is, this ain't a microservice. This is definitely a macro service. Um, what you have in the image is pretty close to a complete Oracle 7, or Oracle Linux 7 environment. So as far as the database is concerned, it is running on pretty much a complete operating system right down to things in the Etsy directory. But because you're doing this inside of a Docker container with the overlay uh, file system, you can just make your image and then you can make containers about as fast as you can type. And when you the database is running in basically a complete Linux environment. I added SSH because an awful lot of the time you need to be able to get into your Oracle environment and do administrative things at the shell. Um, it's amazing how many uh, how many uh, hits on Google I got on that one where people really don't appreciate it when people stick SSH daemons inside of a Docker container to say, no, that's not the way to do it. But in this case, I really think it was necessary. Yeah, so I attribute that to um, a lot of people have uh, objections based on principle, right? So why, why do you not want to do that? Well, most of the time when we think about containers, we think about microservices, as Jeff has said a couple of times, right? Well, what is a microservice? A microservice is a component of a larger application, that is oftentimes, um, one, seen as disposable, right? Two, it is uh, something that is extremely or as small as it needs to be or large as it needs to be, as the case may be, and meant to be instantiated and destroyed relatively quickly. Uh, so usually the example I use is something like WordPress, right? WordPress, I can make as simple as a single container that has you know, Apache and PHP and MySQL and all of that stuff inside of there or I can take it and I can split it out into component microservices, right? I've got a container that's running a load balancer. I've got a container that's running Apache. I've got a container that's running Redis. I've got a container that's running MySQL, right? And I can take each one of those layers and I can horizontally scale it in and out. So why do people not or, or generally frown upon SSH and having SSH be a, a daemon that's running inside of those containers? Because the thought process is, well, it's just a process running inside of the bigger host system. That being said, my philosophy is and always will be, if it looks stupid and it works, it's not stupid, right? So if that's what needs to, to happen for the application to work, if that's what the uh, user requirements are, if that's what the application requirements are, I personally don't have an issue with it.
it may be that this, what Oracle has done wasn't the original, or maybe it's not the prime use case for Docker, but it, it definitely works both for when you look at the technology of how it, what you're actually doing when you study what they've done in order to make the Docker image and then what it, what you do when you run the, your Docker container from a technology point, it suddenly makes a lot of sense. It's like, Oh, I'm honestly, my reaction is, huh? I hadn't really thought about this before, but it really does work. And that's the second important thing. It, it does make sense and it does work. It's just the initial impression. It's, I'm almost afraid to release this video because it's sort of Docker, but that's beside the point. I think I'd be more worried about scaring people off because I use the word Docker as opposed to trying to latch on to a hot buzzword of Docker. But just to give you an example of some of the timings here, so building the Docker image for this thing takes something like 20 minutes because it's got to download so many packages and install them and construct the environment for the Oracle database. But once you've done that, then spinning up a new Oracle instance, uh, when you have access to something like a, a Flex clone, takes, in my timings, 22 seconds. And that is, I mean, try, beat that with any other database as a service technology. 22 seconds, and you have a fully operational Oracle database running in its own isolated environment where you can log into SQL Plus, you can start using your database, your applications, you can go in with SSH if you want to do something. That's pretty impressive. There's a lot of DBAs that will be out of a job if, <laughs> if it gets much easier than this. Yeah, and, and what you're contributing to, I guess, is what I'll call it, right, is sort of a, a bigger trend that we're starting to see with containers, um, which you called a macro container, right, is taking advantage of that application packaging concept behind Docker, in that I can take this big application that formerly was deployed as a, a you know, a, a big process, think Windows next, next, next finish, or, or RPM install and all this other configuration, maybe it was managed through Puppet or Ansible manifest, something like that before. I can take all of that, right, 20 plus minutes of install process, put it into a container that I can now put on any host and run within 20 seconds, right? What did you just said, 22 seconds. So as a, a software vendor, who even if I'm not adopting a microservice philosophy for my application, right, even as a, as a IT organization, right, I just want to make it easier to deploy an application. I don't have to break that out into microservices and have 47 different containers running across 10 different hosts or anything like that. I can take my application and stick it wholesale into a container, and now I have a controlled environment that is going to be the same regardless of whether it's Justin executing it on his laptop, me on my laptop, executing in the data center, executing in the cloud, right? It's going to work exactly the same because that container isolates everything. So this is really one of the advantages that we're starting to see with um, what are, are starting to be referred to as lift and shift operations, right? I'm taking old mode two or uh, sorry, platform two slash mode one applications, putting them into a container, and now I'm able to host it inside of a platform three mode two type of IT infrastructure. You know, and, and actually, I don't want to I don't want to grab the wheel and pull us off the course here. But but just to make a comment, that's why I personally hate those definitions and don't like using that terminology to try to define things, because I don't think it's that clean. I don't think there is such a thing as a platform three application. There is a platform three design paradigm or architecture and you can take and, and as you said, as long as you, you, you deploy the application correctly and you really think it through and you've got proper controls and, and the architecture complies to, to, to the core principles, you can take a traditional client server application and deploy it in a platform three methodology. Yeah, uh, Glenn and I, you and I have talked about this before, right? Of you know, mo mode one and mode two is, um, I I'd, I don't agree with the philosophies that are described therein because it implies that mode two doesn't care about things like availability and security and and reliability and all these other things. It's just kind of a wild west of stand it up and let it die whenever it does. Um, but that's usually not the case at all, right? It's both a mode one and a mode two type of IT operation care about the same things. They're just going about it with fundamentally different application architectures. Yeah, so so in this instance, we're taking, uh, and for the, for the purpose of this demo, it, it was the Docker uh, runtime, but you know, grab Kubernetes or any of these configuration management platforms and, and do the same thing these days, um, and, and taking a traditional mode two client server application, the traditional 
right client server application in Oracle and and by simply changing how we're deploying it, all of a sudden this this agility comes in. And as 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 Jeffrey said, you know, we're looking at 20 second deploy times to stand up a brand new instance. You know, 20 second deploy times, you can completely rewrite the rule book around, you know, how you're gonna use this tool um, b b because that's so fast. And I got to plug uh, uh, some, a certain aspect of NetApp here, too. The De deploy time is only half because of Docker. That's what allows us to get the runtime, operation, uh, runtime environment operational. But the other half of this is what we've done with the Docker plugin. And this is also an interesting experience for me in about uh, how to use GitHub. So we have a Docker plugin. And they've done a great job with it where it knows how to provision volumes on a NetApp storage system, and then you can use them in your Docker environment. Okay. But here's what else it's got. When you provision a volume, you can select the snapshot schedule for that volume. And that was really important. In addition, you can take a clone from an existing volume, which is also really important. But so in my initial run, what I was doing is just allowing a database to be set up on a couple of NetApp volumes. But then to add the cloning in, what I configured it to do, in, and sorry if I'm getting overly technical here, but I'm, for the database audience out there that eventually listens to this, you'll get this. One of the volumes is the data files and only the data files. The second volume is everything else, control, file log, control files, redo, and archive logs. Oracle 12C no longer requires you to be in any particular mode to take a snapshot-based backup. So what this does, when you create this, this database inside of a container, you, it is pre-configuring the data file volume for snapshots at five minutes past the hour. It's pre-configuring the everything else volume for snapshots at 10 minutes past the hour. That's all you need for a snapshot-based backup and restore and cloning infrastructure. As long as the, sn the snapshots of the not data files are later in time, you are good to go. So now, not only is this an isolated container, but it's got built-in backup and recovery capability. So that was pretty good already. And then I added on to that one where I used our Docker plugin's ability to make a clone. That's why the provisioning takes so fa is so fast. So when you set up the container, it, what it's also doing is taking a clone from a sort of a gold copy of a pre-initialized set of data files, which a customer could customize with any way they want. Maybe you want to add some application code ahead of time, build some special tables, do whatever you need to do. And then that's your gold master. Now, every time you provision a new database, you just take flex clones of those. So the demo I'm working in right now is using a one terabyte um, database. I picked something complicated to demonstrate the scales. So not only am I provisioning a new database in 22 seconds, it's a terabyte. Now, for those of you that um, are familiar with flex clones, you might be thinking something. Wait a second, if you're cloning, you're tied back to the original database. Now you've locked a snapshot. So what I wanted is for the ability to optionally split the clone when I create it. So every time I provision a new database, I have a fully independent copy of the database. That was the last key to the puzzle to have truly like instantaneous provisioning. So I just went out to GitHub uh, and did a lot of Google search, searching, figured out how to download the code. Uh, had no idea what on earth I was looking at and about an hour later figured out that Somebody went and invented a new programming language when I wasn't looking. Uh, it's apparently, it's written in Go. Never heard, had never heard of that before. But it, I got used to it, and then I added in the ability to optionally split the clone. So I stuck this into this sort of community open source code and then talked to the developers and figured out a way to get it back into the main code, and it's there now. So I, could, I have my very own feature in a NetApp product as of about two weeks ago. So we actually covered Go a few weeks ago on the podcast with uh, Ashley McNamara. She's uh, well, she was one of the developer advocates for Pivotal. Now she's at Microsoft, and she was a big proponent of Go. I'm I'm a big proponent of of uh, the whole process that that uh, Jeffrey was just pointing to. You know, the, the one of my favorite sayings. You know, Joel Spolsky coined a very very long time ago. But uh, Yagni, right? You aren't going to need it. And basically saying, don't overthink this thing. Just just do what you need 
And then when it comes time, someone will ask for it. And if you don't have it, you can build it. And, and that's exactly what we ran into here. We had the NDVP and the Trident project and, you know, working on, on building out this ecosystem. And then along comes a use case and goes, well, actually, it would be really useful if I could just tell this to start a clone split after it was done. And, and you know, just go grab the, the source, dive in there, a little bit of, of self-knowledge and, and go learn. In this case, Go happens to be an incredibly easy programming language to, to, to pick up on the fly. Um, and, and away you go. Now it's in the product, right? Anyone in the, in the field can leverage it. And, and really, this is how we all need to go for everything. Everything gets better if, if, if this is the path that we start to take. If, if you're just sitting back waiting for the guy, the smart guy at the top of the tower to tell you how it's going to be, they may never think of it, right? It may never happen. And to me, this is one of the, um, the benefits of the rise of the whole idea of cloud and DevOps, because I've, I've been in the database space for about 15 years now. And for the longest time, if you said the word script, or, even, or at one point, if you even mentioned something open source, you'd get thrown out of the building and then they'd come key your car. Nobody wanted to touch anything like that. And now people have realized, you know what? If I hire some dude that knows how to write 100 lines of Python, I can do magical things that benefit my business and it's easy to find other people that understand it. Now all of a sudden, you people are scripting and programming and downloading things again. And it's just really turned around over the last year, year and a half. I did really get a kick out of the email chain that we had back and forth with Jeff on this whole thing of, he sent us, sent engineering an email that said, hey guys, can, does does the Docker volume plugin support doing clone splits? To which we said, no, but, and I think Rippy responded and said, but you can see here in these lines that it's pretty easy to add an option if you want to do that. And that's literally what he did. Modified the code, sent it back to us. We created a PR and it got pulled into that uh, <laughs> that particular agile sprint. It was added just like that. Okay, I got another Docker question, that, and this is something that I added on to my project later on. And so somebody tell me if I've gone off the rails here. So uh, I reached out to some of the local cloud guys in EMEA, and I was asking about um, Kubernetes and in particular Docker Swarm. And I got some pointers. So I, I, oh, sorry, I should backtrack a little bit. When I was writing the actual PowerPoint, when I was getting ready to present this, I was thinking of all the wonderful things this does. And then I got to the last thing in the list, HA. Now I could have done all this with VMware HA, but that didn't seem like a good option. So I basically got pointed in the direction of Docker Swarm. Um, I. It's like one command to reinitialize the node as a swarm node. And then I added two more nodes into the swarm. And then I, rather than doing Docker run, it's basically just Docker service. And I said one replica. So I've, it seems to be working right. So now what I've got is my initial demo, which was just Docker run, where I'm making containers on one and only one node. And then I switch that where I'm making services that define the database. As far as I can tell, other than some annoying changes in syntax between Docker run and Docker service create, it's the same thing, especially as long as you're doing one instance. So I just started loading up the swarm with about 20 databases and I didn't do anything to make it load balanced, but it seemed to end up more or less load balanced. Not sure how that happened. Uh, maybe it's just the default. And then I did some things like cutting the power on one of the VMs and sure enough, everything just, popped back up within 30 seconds or so on a different node. Am I on the right track? Am I missing something here? Nope. That's that just seemed too easy. That's exactly how it's designed to function. You want to you, you wanna pick that apart, Andrew, and explain why it's working that way? Uh, there's not a lot to pick apart there, right? So for, for people who are familiar with the VMware um, ecosystem, right, VMware nomenclature, you can think of this as being almost like a DRS cluster, right? I have a pool of compute resources that I put into a single cluster, and I simply say, execute this VM. I don't care. I don't really know which host it's actually sitting on. Just make it work. If a host dies, it restarts those VMs on the remaining hosts. Same thing with containers, right? All we're doing is creating a cluster of compute resources inside of Swarm, and then we're telling it, hey, in this instance, execute these Oracle containers, right? It chooses the host based off of its various internal criteria. You can adjust that uh, selection mechanism. It's way down deep in the weeds uh, if you choose to. If a host dies, right, it says, oh, there is supposed to be one replica of this service running somewhere, so I need to restart it. 
right? And takes over from there. So very, very similar conceptual technology. And it, it seems through a lot of this, um, this learning experience, the, the main thing that's tripped me up is when you read, oh, little forums about how Docker and Docker Swarm work or um, the official documentation, the presumption is always there that you are running a very small service that is pretty much stateless. So whether you have one instance or 50 instances is completely irrelevant, where that would be very, very bad if I had 50 different containers attempting to access the same set of volumes for the data files. So, I mean, it, everything I was doing seemed logical. It just It's nice to have confirmation that, yeah, this is how it should be. Yeah, so the containers themselves are, they're still disposable, right? So that Oracle process, the memory it's consuming, all of that other stuff, right, doesn't move from host to host. If I say I need to move this instance because maybe that host is getting full or whatever reason, you're actually shutting down Oracle. You're moving that container image to a different host, right, or pull, doing a Docker pull on that other host and then reinstantiating it. You're just pointing at it at the same set of volumes, right? The Docker volume plugin just manages connecting those volumes over to the new host. So it restarts, it has access to the same data as it did before. So it's not the equivalent of a vMotion where it's moving the state, right, the memory, right, all of that other stuff between hosts. Um, instead, we're just moving the application, right, that process. This is why we refer to containers as being stateless, right? If it's if it uh, ends, right, it takes everything with it. And that's kind of how uh, what or Oracle is designed to address the need for stateful data, I mean, the the redo logs plus the contents of the data files equals the database state at any given moment. So if the thing just dies, as you can, the state is preserved on the disks. So it's very easy to bring it right back. Yeah. So, so Jeff, I'll go ahead and ask you a couple of questions that I get asked a lot about containerized database instances. Um, so the first one is, you know, wh what are the use cases here, right? There's a lot of people who are um, I'll say afraid to put their databases in containers because they don't feel that Docker is production ready or it's not going to function the way that they want or whatever that happens to be. Um, I, I don't see what the problem is. I mean, that's kind of what I've been doing here. I'm, I'm trying to break the model. What is the problem here? That's what I've sat around and answered emails while powering up and powering down my Linux nodes over and over again to see what happens. And I just, I don't see a problem. It just sort of works. And once you get comfortable with the technology, and again, I'm, I'm not a programmer. I'm, well, by university training, I am a biochemist. I just happen to find myself in this IT role. So I, I have to work extra hard to understand what it is that I'm doing here. And it makes sense. It's a very, I don't know what actually could go wrong. I've got the stateful data is being held on a real storage array. So I'm not worried about losing data. I've got the snapshots for backup and recovery and that the use of Docker is wholly irrelevant. That process just works. I can definitely clone, that just works. And let's say a node, let's say Docker is, has some sort of a problem and the node dies. It's not hard to put this back together. I mean, worst case scenario, I've got a couple of volumes with perfectly usable databases on them. But um, if I wanted to build up a new Docker node, all I need to do is remake the image and then glue the exact same volumes back on again, and it just works. So I don't, the, the question to me is sort of what is going to go wrong? Why would you not want to do a database on a container? What are you afraid of doing? And just some vague thing that, oh, it's not production ready. I mean, if, I don't even know what that means. If it works, it works. I mean, no software is perfect. There's, there's always something. And, and what I'm hearing from your perspective is it's not a, there's no technical barrier, right? The, I mean, containers themselves, as I think we both said, right, they're older technology. They're technology that's been in the kernel for a decade. Um, so that's not new, right? Docker as a management plane is relatively new, um, but mostly it just works exactly the way you would expect. Um, and usually the follow-on question that I get is, you know, and I usually make a tongue-in-cheek analogy, right, of, of the only people uh, more stodgy than a DBA or as a storage administrator, right? So how... You know, if it's not a technical issue, it, that means it's usually a political, right, a people issue. So how do we talk to, how do we convince our DBAs that, hey, using containers have tangible benefits, right? Is, can, can we at least try it? Can we, can we experiment with this and see if it meets our needs and get them familiar with it? 
Now, that is kind of the, the crux of my whole position here at NetApp, and that's assembling solutions that are as compelling as I can make them be. And that's the question I have. How do I convince the DBAs that this is something that they should do? And it really is just, it's proof. It's, you, you do the videos to say, this is how it works. You write the TRs that are sort of a reference architecture of how to make things work. You offer support for the NetApp uh, DVP plugin that makes this all work. And there is one technical thing that I would add that I think it's important to, to make this very clear to a DBA audience, you are not running something under Docker or running something inside Docker. I know you mentioned that before, but I really think you have to hammer that point to home. What Docker is doing is just making it a little easier to launch processes and manage processes using the namespace ability of the kernel that's been there all along. Once that's running, Docker's kind of out of it. I mean, you can you can use Docker to clone a machine or to start it or stop it if you want, but it's not like something is running inside Docker. And if you don't make that point really strong, I think that will tend to scare people off because they think of this as a new software product. What you're doing is running Oracle on Linux. You just happen to be using a particular feature of the kernel that no one's really bothered to use up until, oh, I don't know, what, two years ago? Isn't this discussion kind of the discussion we had when virtualization first came out, right? People were like, why would I put my hardware on virtual servers? I can't do that in production. Well, actually, I have a, that one, if, if you remember, so I worked at Oracle during the rise of VMware, and I remember when VMware was a science project because it really was emulating stuff. And the amount of code in the hypervisor itself was... And ran into the millions of lines, so, so the estimates go. That would scare me. And now you are really depending on VMware. But the second all of the virtual, the virtual machine extensions arrived inside of the processors, you don't really, the hypervisor isn't doing that much work. It just says, all right, here's the virtual machine, go. And then it can stand back and just let the CPUs do what the CPUs are designed to do. So the, there's yeah. that that distinction. Yeah, and 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 in this case, really, we're we're uh, as we keep hammering home, but but just to underline with with permanent marker, right? It, this has nothing to do with how the software is ran. It's just it changes how you deploy it. You you pay an upfront cost to get it packaged, and then once it's packaged. Deploying it is near instantaneous and an error. I mean, it's you can't make a mistake. It's you take all the the human error out of the process. Yep. And in the case of of Oracle, what it's very easy to design something where even if you have a lot of human error, even if you do have problems with your physical server, your what your distribution of Linux, whatever, it you can also fix whatever's gone wrong very very easily and safely. And I did test that, by the way. What happens if I accidentally wipe out the complete configuration of a node? What Can I definitely just remake the exact same image, um, and that which takes like you know, 15, 20 minutes, as I mentioned, and then just start it again and attach the volumes? And it pops right back up again. The database, the container recognizes its volumes. The files are where they expect them to be. The database starts. Yeah, so one of the use cases that I tend to talk about a lot with containers and databases uh, is the the CI/CD pipeline, right? Of I have I, I'm modifying code, adding a future a feature, fixing bugs, right? Whatever in my application, I now need to push it into you know the testing pipeline. But I want to do that with actual application data. Well, okay, your Oracle database is running on some you know giant Oracle Spark server in the data center. Well, great, just clone out the underlying volumes introduce them as Docker volumes and attach them to a container that's running, right? And now I can test against the actual data in my database that's been decoupled from the database, right? Layer QoS policy on there if you really want to be careful and see what it's going to behave like, right? When I'm done, I simply destroy my con my Oracle container, I destroy my volumes, and it's like none of it ever happened. Uh, you're going to have a, t in, with an Oracle context, you'll have a little CPU architecture problem with that. But what you can do is... Um, like, well, here's a model that works 
very well for Snap Manager for Oracle and now Snap Center customers. Let's say your production database is on some monster 64 core I86 system or it's on an Exadata system. You set up a standard Oracle replication feed onto a NetApp environment and then you use Snap Center, Snap Manager for Oracle to make the clones. And what, so what you're, you have this constant feed of the live production environment into your little development in Island. And now you can create a little farm of, of VMs and you can then send all the clones out to other these VMs. And that model works very well. This is a way to make it potentially even cleaner, replicate it into a Docker container and then clone the Docker containers. So you're cloning less. You've got one kernel. You've got one operating system installed and just lots of clones running in their own isolated environment. And uh, this is for the DBAs out there, you, because the namespaces of an individual Docker container isolate everything from one another, the processes inside of that namespace cannot see the other processes. That means that if you have an Oracle database running as a SID of NTAP, it can't see any other SMON or PMON processes, so it can't, uh, can it, it can't detect a conflict. That means that I can have one server with 50 databases with the exact same name. And you can't, you can't do that on just a server. That makes certain things a lot easier because let's say that you have an application that is expecting a database name to be called NTAP. If you change the database name, there's frequently a lot of really detailed um, metadata changes and really time-consuming metadata changes that you have to make to the database. This avoids that problem. You don't have to rename the, the database when making the clones. See, th this is why we so, invite the experts to come Sorry for boring on. everyone else. That's a, that's a DBA thing. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's fine. We, we like to be bored. <laughs> yeah. so, so, Jeff, a couple of things, right? Um, so, one, I, I know that you said that you've been working on some collateral, um, you know, a couple of times throughout this podcast. So, uh, when and where can we find that collateral? Okay. So, um, well, I hate to plug social media, but I, I do have two social media presences. Um, there's just tweet of Steiner, and then there's also words dot of Steiner. I will not pester you with pictures of food or cat videos on any of those. I just use that for technical communication. So when I've got this done, I will send an explanation of it and the link to the video. So step one is just getting the complete video, and it'll be First, it'll explain exactly what it does, and then it will be more of a deep dive into how it works. So if people don't have to wade through the technical details to get to the good stuff. What I'm also hoping to do after that is turn this into some kind of a, um, a TR reference architecture. I've got, I'm not sure exactly how to go about that because this is where I need a customer. I need somebody that wants to try something like this. And I know you're out there. Um, Get somebody get in touch, steiner at netapp.com, and someone that would like to look over this and potentially kick the tires on it in a real environment. If it's just dev test, I mean, it, what's the harm? Either it works or it doesn't. The next step would be actually doing this for a real, like, external multi-tenant environment. That would get into the weeds with some of the Docker networking capabilities. That's a much larger project. But at least for an internal dev test multi-tenant environment where you're not worried about that much about internal security, I think this is ready to go. I would just really like to find someone to help me develop the written reference architecture that so when we, when we, pr we publish it, we're sure that this is really meeting the desires of customers and it's documented to the required detail. So have you done a have you done a blog on it on Tweet of Steiner or have you done anything else or blog of Steiner rather? I have not done the blog on it because I'm just I'm in the I only have like ten little video sn snippets of thirty seconds each that I've got to record and then the session is ready to go. So I'd say two weeks at the most. And it's it's blog it's words of Steiner that's what it is words of Steiner dot com right. Yeah, sorry if that sounds kind of lame, but I needed to come up with something in no, a hurry. That's, that's fine. We're just trying to get it out there so people know it's there. And then Tweet of Steiner is your Twitter, right? Yep. All right, that means it tells me it's time to go. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email to podcast.netup.com or send us a tweet at NetUp. As always, if you'd like to subscribe, find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher or via techontechpodcast.com. 
If you like the show today, leave us a review. On behalf of the entire Tech on Tap podcast team, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Jeff Steiner for joining us. As always, thanks for listening. Man, I'm going to go set up some databases. Do you feel smarter now? No, I feel way dumber. I have imposter syndrome right now. Why am I here? I'm in the presence of greatness of the Steiner. I'm excited, man. We're getting to the part of uh, this technology curve where we start to do stuff. Yeah, the use cases are are vital to making this thing work. Yeah. Absolutely. As Glenn said, we're reaching that tipping point.